Shalom Havarim. Welcome, friends in Hebrew. Welcome to a, another episode. I believe this is session 29 of A Jew and Gentile Discuss. And today I'm here uh, as your host, and we have our co-host here, uh, our good brother uh, Mitch Chapman with us today. And we are following in our series, as we do per uh, on every Wednesday. And today... We, of course, want to uh, go back into Hebrews chapter 9 is where we left off last time together. Right around verse 15, we are talking about the Brit Hadashah, the new covenant set up by Yeshua as him, as the Kohen Gadol, as the high priest. And we've been going through how that relates to the offering system and how uh, that which was done in the flesh, we now have in the spirit through the blood and work of Yeshua and how the two go hand in hand and work together as one. One doesn't cancel the other, but they both are continually uh, working together, pointing us to the work of Yeshua. And so in a last time session, we uh, definitely uh, didn't finish that chapter. We're going to finish that chapter today, but something else happened last week that we want to kind of carry on also this week as we began to talk about Pesach. And we had a lot of uh, good points that we made last week, and this week we thought we would carry that on a little bit today too as we get started. Uh, we have uh, Pesach a week from this uh, Friday night. Uh, this next, um, well, a week from this Friday will be Nisan 14. And so Nisan 14 is the day that the lambs are traditionally slaughtered, and then going into the 15th, which would be Friday night at evening, is when the traditional memorial Seder meal would begin, and of course, as believers in Yeshua, we are called, according to Luke chapter um, 11, verse 19, and I think it's 1 Corinthians uh, 11, 24, 22, right around there, uh, Yeshua said to do this in remembrance of me as he held up the wine, as he held up the cup. And we know that this was a covenant meal, as I shared last time. And so the do this in remembrance of me is the memorial of the Seder meal. Amen. And so he initiated the new covenant, began it at that time. And so this week, what we thought we would do, because the question arises by many, uh, is, okay, I'm a, I believe in Yeshua. I believe we're supposed to follow the Torah now. Um, I understand that uh, Easter was my tradition, you know, it was a tradition. I celebrated the resurrection of Yeshua and so forth. I understand that within those traditions, there were some pagan uh, mixing going on. And so I'm forsaking all of that. And I want to get back to the Torah. Uh, but, you know, what's this issue about whether we need to be circumcised or not? Can I do a memorial uh, Seder meal uh, that doesn't have the lamb on the table? Can I do that and give praise and honor to Yeshua as my Savior? Can I do what he asked me to do? And he said, do this in remembrance of me. Or am I disqualified because I am not circumcised? So we want to talk about that subject today because it kind of comes up quite often. Uh, I believe uh, Brother Mitch is going to help us out here. He's going to take us to Exodus 12. We're going to go through the different places where it talks about the goy. All right. And you got to know these different Hebrew words here. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, Brother Mitch, and he's going to walk us through this. So, good well, morning, Brother good, Mitch. Uh, hi, Tony, and uh, welcome everybody who will be uh, watching this whenever you whenever you do. Um, Nissan 14 is is always a uh, a wonderful occasion, and um, not so much because it's era of Pesach, but it is. But it happens to be actually my biblical birthday. Amen. And uh, I, I like to joke and tell people, I know where my parents were, Nissan 14, uh, back in 57, 13. Uh, that would be the actual year on the calendar that I was born. So I think I just gave away my age, but I'm 69 and um, I'm not going anywhere uh, soon. I like to tell people I might very well be too old to rock and roll, but I'm uh, certainly too young to die. Having said that, the, the place that becomes somewhat confusing uh, in the Torah as it relates to Pesach is Exodus 12. 
that great chapter that deals with, in essence, uh, Pesach. And he, from verses 43 to 51, when you're reading it, and those from the nations, the Gentiles, if you will, um, typically become confused as to what do we do? What am I supposed to do? Uh, this is what it says. Um, and then whatever position somebody takes, then they go to verse 49, which says one law, one Torah, one regulation, one teaching, one instruction, one precept, one principle, one doctrine shall be for the native born and for the stranger. Now, where did we have uh, strangers before we had mixed multitude that Moses led up out of Egypt. So the concern here is who can partake? So the only way that this can be unraveled, the only way that this can really be properly Of what the Hebrew is, and then understanding the meaning of the Hebrew words. When you do that in this section of scripture, it becomes crystal clear. It really does. And when you do that in every other area of scripture, guess what? It really does. So this is in part why we are always strongly suggesting to take the time. You don't have to become a Hebrew linguist. You don't have to take the time to become a Greek linguist. You don't have to become fluent in Hebrew or Greek. But what you can do is you can take the time to go to the online sources that are free, readily available, and just click, 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 click. And you'll be surprised at what you find. So having said that, here's the question. That's asked. So, you know, there's many times that the Gentile believers or believers from the nations misunderstand the commands, the mitzvot, the mishpatim, uh, the hukot, the, uh, the commands, the commandments, the judgments, uh, the rules, the regulations, the ordinances, if you will, um, that are banned from keeping a Seder. The, the Seder is the actual meal. Others believe that an uncircumcised person can't partake in a Seder. So just a very cursory look by reading the English, it would appear that Torah is actually saying that unless a person is circumcised and made conversion to Judaism, that they can't celebrate Pesach. Is this true? But so, so Brother you... Mitch, what one thing to help um, maybe our audience uh, see this clearly. So when you say Seder, um, that word, from my understanding, means order, right? It has to do with an order th of things. Is that correct? Correct. And when you say Pesach, when you say Passover, uh, that within the scriptures is directly pointing you to the lamb. Is that correct? You broke up um, a oh, little okay. bit. So you said so, like, so, um, like, so the Seder means order. So that when we're talking about right. a Pesach Seder, we're talking about the whole ceremonial, traditional uh, way of uh, in order of celebrating 
the meal. And then when we talk about Pesach, when we use that word Pesach or Passover, you're literally talking about the lamb, which obviously we can't have one on the table right now because we don't have a temple. But I think it's important to know the distinction between those two things. Uh, do you or am I correct or help clear things? Um, uh, yeah, uh, that that is correct. Uh, Seder is just the order. Um, our God is a God of order, so our God is a God of Seder. <laughs> Amen. Okay. So, so when um, we when we are having when we say okay, so this next uh, um, Pesach celebration, this next memorial celebration, uh, w you know, when people are coming to the table, they're going to be doing the Seder together, and um, which means we're going to be going through the order. And the I, we call it a Pesach Seder. We call it a Passover Seder. Um, and I think maybe and you can help me with this. Uh, you and I understand that to mean there, there would be a lamb on the table, but there really isn't going to be one. Uh, so we're using this word, I mean, from a biblical standpoint, when you're reading it, it's going to say, eat the Seder. Or, I'm sorry, eat the Passover. And it's the Lord's right. Passover. And it's like really honing in, not on the Seder, but on the lamb, right? Exactly. Okay. And and the point uh, is, and this is where... We lost you there, Brother Mitch. You'll probably unfreeze here in just a second. We've been having a little bit of technical difficulty uh with it periodically freezing up, but I think, uh, yeah, here he is. Okay, so uh, just recently from one of the many congregations that I mentor and disciple uh, in Uganda, uh, asked me a question similar to, to this. And the concern was, um, when should new believers become circumcised? And uh, my response back was, um, what does Romans say? Romans 2, 25 through 29. Okay. And then I asked a, a, a question. The questions that I ask are not to be deflective. It, it, I I answer a question in the typical Jewish fashion, and that is by responding with another question. Sure. And that is done not to be demeaning, not to be condescending, not to be deflecting, but to help somebody think. That's it. And sadly, today, um, there's just a, a, a lot of people that don't want to think, that just want everything handed to them, and they don't want to read, and you're not going to grow by having things handed to you. So Yeshua says, go and make disciples. Part of making disciples is pointing people to where in the scripture you can find the answer. Amen. That way, by pointing somebody to an area of the scripture, maybe it be a chapter, might it be a verse, it could be a section of uh, a portion of the scripture, whatever it might be, you're giving the person the answer by not giving them the answer. You're actually helping them to... get into the scripture so that they can read for themselves and perhaps by reading for themselves will help them to no longer be conflicted in what they were thinking. But also there's the other side to it. And that is by reading, I don't know about you, and this is a general question to other people out there. But when I'm reading scripture, I have become accustomed to asking 
the six basic questions, who, what, where, when, why, and how. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, <clears throat> other questions will typically pop up in your mind. When that happens, that really unlocks the mind and it really helps you to go deeper than the surface level right. behind the scripture. And the questions that you ask, anybody who is a, a real teacher will not poo-poo your question. They're, at, they're always attempting to invite you to ask questions. Right. But for some, because of maybe you didn't do so well in school or you didn't attain the level of education that you like to have, maybe somebody in your life or on your job has always called you dumb, stupid, silly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Wherever I go, I make it very clear that there are no dumb questions. There are no silly questions. There are no stupid questions, except, well, Mitch, you just said there, there's no dumb, silly, stupid question. Now you're saying except, well, what's the exception? Here it is. Right. The one you chose not to ask. Amen. Why didn't you ask it? By asking questions, You froze again, Brother Mitch. You'll be back here in just a second. There you are. I know. By, by not asking a question or questions, well, by asking questions, you're demonstrating humility. Yeah. Isn't it, well, I'll continue my thought. When you don't ask questions, you're demonstrating pride. Isn't it interesting that as part of the Seder, we come to a section, there, there's four questions. We know the main four questions. Why is this night different from all other nights? And then we go, and that, that's the major question, okay? But there's four other questions that relate to the four different types of sons. And I always like to have fun with that because no matter how large the group might be or how small it might be, and um, this year I'm going to be leading a Seder in a private home. And by the way, Seder should be done in a private home. Uh, that, that was the biblical fashion. I understand why there's big banquet halls. I understand why people do them in their congregation. I get that. That's not wrong. But all that I said was that way back when, it was always a house thing. That's all. Nothing more, nothing less. It's become a big thing over the past, well, at since I've been in faith, which is 28 and a half years, coming up on 29 shortly, is because it becomes a very highly evangelic event. If the leader has some form of even a meager gift of evangelism, but if the leader doesn't understand that you're going to have a whole slew of Jewish people that you probably haven't met before. And then also mostly are not of faith, biblical faith in Yeshua. You have a wonderful opportunity to clearly walk through the Seder and demonstrate how similar to the tabernacle, everything points to Yeshua with the highlight being the matzo and the third cup of wine referred to as the cup of salvation or the cup of redemption. 
And I think uh, as teachers, this is where I think people need to understand where me and, and Brother Mitch are coming from. As teachers, we really have to be specific on how we define our terms, that we're using specific words because they mean a specific thing in what we're talking about. And generally, people don't spend the time to do that. They throw words around, and that's where the confusion comes in. Uh, very few people knew that, you know, uh, the Pesach, that word, was literally, it's not pointing necessarily to the whole Seder. It's pointing to a specific item in the Seder meal, obviously the center of attention of all, the Pesach lamb, which Yeshua is our Pesach lamb. So it's centerized for a reason. So when we say Pesach, um, we are talking about the lamb. And that's where I think, again, people get confused. You know, there were Seder meals going on all the time. Paul's in the diaspora, right? People can't get to Yerushalayim. So there's not going to be a Pesach lamb on the table, but they're doing a Seder. They're doing the memorial as best they can. Go ahead, Brother Mitch. Yeah, that, that's right. And uh, in fact, earlier before we started our little uh, you know, live uh, session here, uh, you, know, you and I always uh, kind of catch up with what's going on in our lives. And uh, boy, this week was uh, a long one. Sure. <laughs> But one of the questions uh, that I asked you was, uh, as I do, um, as I've done, I should say, throughout the, the number of years that we've known one another, and even before we actually, uh, you know, met uh, years ago at a Seder, by the way, um, He'll be back here in just a second. There he is. I've come to the place in my life that if I don't know, I'm going to ask. Amen. Yeah. Okay. Not only will I ask because I don't know, but I will ask questions because I want to know more. So there's nothing wrong with asking questions. Right. Except if you have been put down by asking questions, or you're like one of the sons mentioned during the Seder that the son doesn't ask because he doesn't know how. Every one of us can find or can associate with one of the four sons mentioned during the Seder. So please ask questions. Please, please, please. So we, uh, you know, I did that again to make the point uh, earlier today to, you know, I, I didn't uh, tell you what I thought. I just said, here's the reading of it. This is the word that I'm focusing in on. What is your take on what the word means? And not only that, but what is your take on what the context is in which the word is being used? Yep. And you, you you confirm my thoughts. Now, how much more, much more, but how much more by doing the same thing when it relates to a passage of scripture? Sure. You know, much, yep. much, much more. Yeah, I mean, otherwise you're talking past somebody and you lost them and uh, they don't know how to pick it back up again because they're thinking of a word being defined a certain way that you're not even defining it. And so if you don't ask the question, we can never bring you back around and at least tell you how we're defining the word. You may agree or disagree with it, but at least you know this is the path that we're on. Uh, we went back, we defined the word this way, and this leads us, I mean, everything needs to be biblically sound according to how the Bible interprets the word. So that's, that's just our goal as teachers, you know, um, exactly. And, and so we have said uh, often is that somebody says something, don't just automatically respond. Just take a step back. You have two ears and one mouth. That should automatically mean 
that we should be doing something that we typically don't guilty as charged, but listen twice as much as we speak. Right. But then somebody says, and people who are in sales know what I'm about to say. And that is you're talking to somebody either face to face or on the phone, uh, whatever it might be. And to be clear, you want to be certain that you heard correctly what they just said. So what, and, and I, I, I'm on the telephone and uh, I, there's nothing wrong with being a professional telemarketer, okay? Um, when you're in ministry as I am, you end up with the gift of gab and, you, and if you're Jewish, then you can schmooze with anybody. <laughs> and and I, I don't sell on the phone, I schmooze all day long when, I, when people give me the opportunity. So it's a lot of fun. It also opens up opportunity to minister to other people because in what I do, people open up. And when I'm hearing that there's an issue going on in their life, before we say goodbye, I'm asking them, can I pray for you? Oh, please, would you please? And, and you just made somebody, you just blessed somebody but you also receive the blessing. Amen. But all of that to say this is that, so if I'm understanding what you said, you mean this, is that correct? What, what was wrong with that? Right. Did that make you dumb? Did that make you silly? Did that make you stupid? No, no. no. it made you to the person or it should make you to the person who had just spoken, oh, number one, I better slow down. Otherwise, we're not going to understand one another at all. And number two, this guy is, oh, this person. So that is, if that is so, why don't you stop me? And why don't you ask me, what is it right. that I just said, as opposed to allowing me to continue, which I will. Right. And until you get stopped. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then it's like, well, okay. So, so, brother, so this is how it, this is how it seems to go for me. Um, we look at the command in Luke there where Yeshua says, do this in remembrance of me. And we understand that, you know, as uh, Torah observant followers of Yeshua, that he's talking about the Seder meal there, that he's initiating the, the, the new covenant. And every year when uh, Pesach comes around, we are to, you know, walk through the Seder meal and do this in remembrance of Yeshua. Uh, and then we go over to 1 Corinthians 7, uh, and we see that it states, Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, let him walk in this way. I give this rule in all of Messiah's communities. This is Paul speaking. Was anyone called when he was already had been circumcised? Let him not make himself uncircumcised. Has anyone been called while uncircumcised? Let him now allow himself to be circumcised. I'm sorry, let him not allow himself to be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping God's commands matter. And so you would begin to tell me that, okay, the command about being circumcised, you can't be a part of the Seder meal unless you're circumcised. But yet Yeshua said, do this in remembrance of me. Paul is giving a command to the communities is saying, hey, if you came to Yeshua uncircumcised, don't seek circumcision. So Paul's trying to keep you from celebrating and keeping the the command of Yeshua to do this in remembrance of him. This doesn't make sense. This is like, you know, on the outset, it seems like it's contradicting one another. Uh, but in reality, I think Brother Mitch is going to straighten this out. It, does, it doesn't contradict at all. No, not, not at all. In fact... Um... He says it, let, let's remember that what Shaul does is he uh, talks about 
uh, many times he talks about the same thing to different congregations. Mm -hmm. And let's remember that these are not churches. These are messianic congregations. Amen. Okay. There's no such thing as a church. Sorry to break the bad news. <laughs> to you. But, well, I mean, in first uh, Corinthians five, he just said, let us celebrate the feast. I mean, just two chapters prior to seven here, he's saying, let us all celebrate the feast. So, so in, in Romans two, he talks about the same issue that he does to the Corinthians. He's a little bit more specific. Amen. And it's in uh, chapter two, verses 25 through uh, 29. And I'll read it. This is the new King James. So for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the Torah. Amen. But if you are a breaker of the Torah, uh, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Now, the word that's there is not Torah, but it's law in English. And I think we would we can all say that it's either A, the actual Torah, or it is referring to, as most of the time, Shaul uh, uses nomos. It doesn't relate to the Torah. It relates to a section of the Torah that's called the Book of the Law, which was initiated or instituted because of the incident of the molten or golden calf. And we're now given a treaty, not a covenant, from Leviticus 1 through the end of Torah proper in Deuteronomy 34. So I, for some, I know that's very deep and didn't never heard that before. But let's just continue on with whatever you believe the word law relates to. Okay, and we'll just keep it at that. Therefore, in verse 26, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills Or is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, verse 29 of Romans chapter 2, who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter. Praise is not from men, but from God. And Romans 2, 29, he's drawing that thought back from Torah as he almost always does in this particular case from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. Now, let's get back to uh, the point that we're trying to or attempting to bring out. So if we go to the, the issue again, in when we're reading through the Brit HaDashah, uh, in Matthew, in Luke, in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, etc., when Yeshua is, he's, he lifts up the cup and says, do this, or he takes the bread, which we know is matzah, and says, do this. What is the this that Yeshua is referring to? Is he referring to the cup and or the bread a, or is he actually referring to the greater context of what is happening, which is, in fact, a, a meal, a Seder meal, as it would be referred to today? Depending upon what your view is, you will create a new doctrine, mm -hmm. or you will maintain something that has been going on for about 3,500 years. Now, all of that to say this, if you are coming to the scripture, and this goes for any section of scripture, without any preconceived notion, just come clean. 
just pray Psalm 119, 18. Open my eyes that I would see wonderful things from your Torah. Do that and say, Lord, God, Adonai, Hashem, show me what this is really saying. Remove anything that I have been taught, caught, thought, or bought. I don't want to be caught up in any more church terminology and theology. I don't want to be caught up in any more denominational doctrine and definition. I want to know what the pure, unadulterated scripture is actually saying. And when you do that with a pure heart, you're going to find the answer. Now, here's what will happen. When you find the answers, there's going to be, well, oh, wait a second. <laughs> Right. Because you've come to a truth, a biblical truth, that for the most part, either A, you never heard it that way before, or for the most part, what you've heard in the past is not lining up with scripture. And now the mind starts working. And if you are uh, or have an inquiring mind, and inquiring minds want to know, you're going to start asking questions. Sure. And when you're in a church, who are you going to ask the questions to? The pastor or your Sunday school teacher or one of the deacons or the deacon, deaconess or however it works. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Sure. But what kind of answers are you going to receive? There, that, that's where, that's the issue. So, sadly, as a as an ethnic Jew, as a eth ethnic Messianic Jew, from time to time, during the course of the year, and typically uh, during uh, the period of time of But from those who are my ethnic Jewish cousins who either reject Yeshua completely or accept his messiahship, but deny his deity. And this has been going on for almost 29 years. It gets old, but you know what? It equips you to learn to deal with the things. But all of that to say this. Read the scripture for yourself without any preconceived notion. Go behind the English words to find out the meaning of the Greek and the, and the Hebrew. Ask questions of those that you trust. And if you're getting a conflicting answer from someone that you trust, for instance, you heard this in church, you heard this from that teacher, and you're reading scripture yourself, and now you've come to the understanding that what this one said, what that one said, is not really lining up with the scripture. Find someone that you can trust ask the question and if they have a pure heart what they will do is they will help you to walk through by asking you questions to have an understanding as to where you're coming from that's ministry that's not deflection mm -hmm. that's not poo-pooing somebody but as i do almost all of the time especially when it's somebody that I really don't know, you're asking me a question, I'm going to learn, attempt to find out what is the basis 
of you asking the question. There's something that came up that brought that question to mind. That's what I'm trying to get after. I, I, it's not because I'm coming after you. It's not because I want to poo-poo you away. It's, right. I'm trying to understand your mindset. And when and, and this is similar to you have uh, you have a car. Your car has a problem. You bring the car to the mechanic. The mechanic says, hey, uh, thank you for coming. How can I help you? And then, well, I got a problem with the car. Mechanic says, well, what seems to be the issue? And then what are you going to say? You're the mechanic. You should know. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. The mechanic has to do what? Going to have to hook up your car to the diagnostic machine and get the basic read and understand some basic things or ask questions. Is it doing this? Is it doing that? It's the same thing. So we came at that point from different ways, not to uh, beat a horse dead, but to emphasize that it's really important to read, to go deeper, to ask and by asking, you're going to learn. All right. So. So, yeah. So, basically, we've come down to two, two paths you can go. Either Yeshua was starting something brand new and doing away with the old and wanting you to do, you know, what many would say communion, which that word wasn't even there in the first century, invented much, much later. Or he's speaking of the actual uh, entire Seder meal that is supposedly, you know, wh which we do believe is pointing to him. So, I mean, those are our two paths. Either Yeshua is starting something new and getting rid of the, of the old, or he's shining a, uh, a beam of light on the original to show you the truth of what it's pointing at, and we need to continue in it. That, that's kind of how I see it, you know. Well, those that, are, those are our two questions. Yeah, that's good, Tony. And I remember uh, way back now, you know, people, um, <laughs> I, I, I start laughing um, because I know where I came from and I know how I've gotten to where I the time you know when when you perceive that they're real after asking basic questions i do the same thing mm -hmm. and it, it, it's it's really humbling it really is so how does that happen and i i don't know uh you know that the deuteronomy 29 29 deal right. but um The point that I was making is that when I came to faith, I, I was in the church. And for the, it wasn't until in, real, in reality, um, 2008, that I came out of the church for good, or maybe it was 2006 for good. <clears throat> But then for even for that, it was like, you know, there was so much that I had to unlearn. And I remember when uh, Beth the Vinu uh, synagogue uh, was getting going and I'm sitting around and I'm like, well, this is weird. Uh, and I went to uh, one of the elders and I said, uh, when are we gonna have communion? <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. What? Jew boy asking the question. Okay. And put his hand on me, uh, on my shoulder, looked at me lovingly in the eye, said, Mitch, we do it once a year at Pesach. And I went, duh. <laughs> Many times the obvious is not obvious until it's spoken to you. It's been right there all of those years 
But because of the indoctrination that somehow Pesach is no longer Pesach, that Yeshua, in fact, did start, which he didn't, something brand new, communion, which never existed, that it has now become not a joyous celebration, but it's become a solemn occasion. It's almost like high church. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> and there's a lot of things like that that I could share about where I came from and the, the revelation that I received, not because, you know, it basically because of asking a question. Right. What would have happened if I never asked the question? Right. Here's what would have happened. Would have gone to a Seder and it would have, oh, la, 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 I know this. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. So the, the context is, is really important. And the context of the this. The, this. He mentions this. Do this. Do this. Do this. Over and over and over in Matthew, in Luke, in 1 Corinthians. Look at the context. And then tell me. You tell me what the this really refers to well, is it go ahead is it the the cup and the bread do this as often as you remember me weekly monthly quarterly or is it in reality the one once a year memorial that was long since established that Yeshua is now bringing home and saying, hey, guys, you've been doing this all this time. Just like the tabernacle, it's all about me. And so prayerfully this year, when uh, if you go to a seder if you're going to a seder conducted by someone else or you're going to someone's house perhaps and prayerfully the person that would be leading you through Seder and I'm looking forward to having a private Seder this year. I haven't haven't done one, haven't led one in, in many years. Mm -hmm. um, it's always been a congregational thing or it's been in someone's house. You know, and that's fine. But do this in remembrance of me, and the this is in context. Pesach, the Last Supper, is Seder meal. And, so, and another way I like to connect it, uh, Brother Mitch, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, to all our uh, deity deniers out there, this is this is him claiming his deity right here. I mean, he is literally putting him play, himself in the place of the Seder meal. And uh, I know Brother Mitch is going to be going to Exodus 12 here soon, and, and, and I'm kind of there right now just kind of skimming it as he's talking. And verse 14 just stands out to me where Yahweh says, this day is to be a memorial for you. You are to keep it as a feast to Yahweh. And, and here's Yeshua saying, do this in memory of me. It's like he, he would have to be, for someone, if you claim he's not deity, he's taking the focus of Passover, Pesach, and putting it on him. If he's not deity, he's pulling it away from Yahweh. I mean, it's like, no, that's a deity claim right there. And it's centrally focused. I think he's kind of, I think everyone at the table knows he's, he's talking about Exodus 14. He's, he's bringing it right back there. We're supposed to be doing this as a memorial. Now it's the sun. Now it's all in, in, on the sun. I don't know. That's just kind of, 
popped out to me. Yeah, that that's really good, Tony. Um, there's well, again, what, when you take the time to read scripture, there's going to be things that are just going to be popping out at you all over the place. Yeah, and so take a notebook have something to write with Amen. then you have the notebook to write on make your notes uh, what i do what i've done for for years is i take notes by book by chapter by verse and my mind is is really weird uh, maybe other people's minds works the same way i can remember in what book i have it written and then I just have to go, you know, one of the one of the the notebooks that I have, and then I'll just have to go flipping through it, remembering that something was said relating to that Torah portion. What was that again? Right. I, I may not remember exactly what was said, but I recall something was said, and because I wrote it down, now I have a record of it, and I can go back and fish it out. And then the difficult part for me is I have to try to decipher what I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> that could be, yeah, that could be a challenge. <laughs> it has been. So, okay, so Exodus 12, we're going to uh, walk through um, 43 through um, 51. So setting so up, the, Lord, setting up uh, the stage again, just so you guys, uh, if you... We're, so we've already initiated or established that uh, Yeshua is talking about the entire Seder meal, that we are to continue to do it. You'll find nowhere in the first century that they stopped doing it. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians 5, which is in the late 50 CE, Paul is encouraging them to keep Pesach, to keep the Passover. That would have been a perfect time for him to say, no, just focus on the bread and the wine. We don't need that other stuff anymore. You know, but he doesn't. And so the question now arises, if you're not circumcised, can we can we come? Can we come? And so Brother Mitch here in 1243, he's going to begin to open up the Hebrew here. So uh, and uh, Hashem said to Moshe and to Aharon, this is the ordinance of the Pesach. OK, I'm going to just. Um, throw in some basic Hebrew words here and then we'll go back and unpack the meaning and I think that'll be uh, a lot easier so no foreigner shall eat it hmm. no foreigner shall eat of the Pesach the Passover so here's here's an initial problem right here right off the bat here we are in April of 2022 we're using a 21st century mindset, trying to unravel, trying to unpack a first century document. Well, actually, this is not even first century. Who is bought for money when you have circumcised him, then he may eat it. So, no foreigner can eat, but any servant, that would be a foreigner typically, although there could be some uh, people of your own tribe or of another tribe that became slaves to you and as we walk further in the Torah and Leviticus, we see, uh, we get to understand the principles of redemption. So no foreigner can eat it, but every man's servant who is bought for money, when you have him circumcised, he can eat it. So you have a foreigner that can't eat, but a foreigner who can if he's circumcised. Hmm. So it seems to say 
in these two verses, you have to be circumcised. Otherwise, you can't eat if you're a foreigner. Okay, let's continue. A sojourner, verse 45, and a hired servant shall not eat. Hmm. Now, wait a second. You just said in 44 that every man's servant who is bought for money, he can eat when you have him circumcised. And now you're saying in 45 that any hired servant can't eat. Boy, we have some problems here already. It seems like Torah is being conflicting. You're telling me one thing here, and now you're saying something completely different and opposite over here. Is that really true? Who is the one that's really conflicted? Us. Okay. In verse 46, in one house it shall be eaten. This is why a Seder, the celebration of the Lord's Passover, the one-time memorial event, should be biblically. And again, there's no big deal if there's a, in a banquet hall, you're in your congregation, um, or you're going to have it in a private home. But, and some people will say, no, I can't do that because, okay, nothing wrong with that. But I won't hold you, or maybe I will hold you to some things that you're not doing because the Torah says you should do it. Or conversely, I won't hold you to certain things that the Torah says you shouldn't do, but you are. So who gets to pick and choose? Do you, do you see the issues here when you don't have a balanced approach? Yep. That you become hyper this way, hyper that way. It's like, what's the matter with being balanced? Why can't you just take the center position Understand what scripture says and then think through what it doesn't say by asking questions of the text. Who, what, where, when, why, how. And then by understanding what is being said by what wasn't written. And th that's a process, trust me. But after a while, you can really understand what somebody meant by what they didn't write and what somebody meant by what they didn't say. Right. In one house it shall be, you shall not carry any of the flesh outside of the house, nor shall you break one of its bones. 47, all the congregation of Israel shall keep it. So for uh, th this one, I have a lot of fun with. And here's why. Because we know that in the church world, there is a rush to make application. not grafted in. When you came to faith, are you now no longer, or, or are you now not part of the Commonwealth of Israel? Or when you came to faith, did you not become a seed of Abraham? Yep. And th these are basic questions not to pin anybody's ears back, but just to say, let's think this thing through. You are saying all of this stuff here is all Jewish things. And I'm sharing with you, well, if we go to Galatians 3.29, you would say you're part of Abraham's seed and according uh, to the promise, right? If you go to Ephesians 2.12, you would say you were part of the Commonwealth of Israel. If you go to Romans 11, 
you would say you've been grafted in. If you go to Galatians 6, you would say you're part of the Israel of God. So why is this now no longer you are part of Israel? When there was in Exodus 12, 38, a mixed multitude. Right. I mean, uh, one of the words I like to, to uh, bring out here is congregation, Brother Mitch. Congregation is made up of all kinds of people groups. It was all kinds of people groups that was standing there at Sinai. And the Hebrew word here is Ada, And Ada is a witnessing body. Are we not all part of the witnessing body of Messiah? Are we not all Israel? I mean, you know, it's just, you got to put it together. And it's, it's really not difficult. It just goes to perspective. Mm -hmm. And what you've been taught, what you've caught, what you've thought, and what you bought. And if you maintain the church theology and terminology, if you maintain the denominational definitions and doctrine, you're going to, nope, that's not for me. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, 48. And when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his mouths be circumcised. So here we have you got to be circumcised. You can't eat if you're not circumcised. I want to be circumcised. I got to be a servant if I'm not circumcised. Then I have to be bought with money. And more and more and more. It's like, Moses, tell me plainly what's going on here. Right. And he shall be as a native of the land for no uncircumcised person shall eat it. Here again. Over and over and over. And then to reinforce the whole schmear, 49, one law. This is where we get the one law uh, doctrine from, which doesn't mean one law, by the way. One law shall be for the native born and for the stranger who dwells among you. So we'll just finish with 50 and 51. Thus all the children of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. And it came to pass on that very same day that the Lord brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt according to their armies. Brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. This is 1251 at this point in time. You have those from the nations, the mixed multitude referred to specifically in 1233, now joining and becoming part of the children of Israel. And predominantly throughout scripture, from here on forward, we don't see in Torah a difference between or a classification of well, these are Gentiles, and these are B'nai Yisrael. No, it's all the... Tr so let's unpack it with the Hebrew now, because this is where it becomes a lot of fun. So let, we'll go back to 43. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Pesach. So what is this ordinance about? What is this Pesach about? We hear this Hebrew word Pesach and automatically, what do we think? We think Passover. Is that what the ordinance is? Or is it something deeper? And it really is something deeper. Because, yes, it is referring to Passover in a broad sense. 
but in a specific particular sense, it's relating to the offering presented in this period of time at the tabernacle. And this is what this ordinance relates to being referred to in 1243. How, it's not so much here, how do I present it? It's who can, who can actually present it? Who can actually become involved with physically bringing a Pesach offering? That's really the question. Sure. The question is not, can I eat the meal? No. The question is, who can bring an offering? And who can bring a specific offering? And the specific offering that's being taught, talked about here that one can bring is the Pesach offering, predominantly the lamb. So now we, we unpack it a little bit further. So it says no foreigner. The Hebrew word here, it's a compound word. It's ben nakar. Ben nakar. And ben nakar means, well, we'll, we'll get to it a little bit later uh, in just a while. Um, rather than... Yeah, maybe we'll should deal with it now. So what is what's been the car in twelve forty three? So you you read it and it says no foreigner. Okay, well foreigner. So that means that somebody who is not an Israelite, someone who's not an ethnic Jew, someone who uh, is from a different place. So for instance, when I go to Africa, I'm a foreigner. But does that mean that I'm not under the laws of the, that land, the constitution of that country? Of course I am. I'm still a US citizen, but now I'm in a foreign land and I'm in essence a stranger. So that's what Ben the car actually means, son of a stranger. So the, the word here, uh, Nahor or Nahri, usually describes uh, something alien to be excluded. The word is regularly used of Israel's armies and of the nations that are characterized by foreign gods and idolatry. The foreigner regularly represents foreign peoples or foreign wives. The adjective is used to describe Strange woman of Proverbs 2 16. I go on with a whole bunch of different scripture. And by the way, if you want this, it's available. Just let us know and I'll be happy to send it to you. It, it's really um, eye opening and will really help people to understand that you can really do what you thought you couldn't do because you had to do something that's not commanded to begin with. So it, it means apostate in Reformed Judaism, an apostate or an idea. The faith of Abraham. And this is kind of like leaning towards Noahide laws. The reading would support Shaul's theological opponents who were saying that Gentiles must be circumcised for salvation. So, no Ben the car, no son of a stranger is to eat it, but every man's slave purchased with money after you have him circumcised, he can eat it. A sojourner, a transient, the Hebrew word is toshav, 
in uh, verse 45. Hoshav is someone who only temporarily is passing through the community of Israel. Rabbinic Judaism, or the different forms of the rabbinic Judaisms, refers to this person as a B'nai Noah. And on Facebook, you'll see people who proudly declare that they're B'nai Noah. Yeah, I've seen it. And yeah. So, what does that avail you? Yeah. What, why can't you use your real name? I mean, what what does that do? I, I I don't get it. Okay. Rabbinic. Hear me loud and clear. Rabbinic Judaism refers to this person as a bnei Noah. The Torah doesn't. Yeah, I've also uh, seen, uh, Brother Mitch, I've also seen them say Zadik um, Toshav. They are Zadik Toshav, uh, a righteous visitor, a righteous, you know, foreigner. Um, and, that, and, that's, well, and that's what they're doing. They're connecting it to the Noahide. They're within that line of the Noahide laws, yeah. But also, uh, in uh, throughout the, the Talmud, there's a teaching that there is a righteous Gentile in every generation. Hmm. So it's like our uh, friends who are JWs, Jehovah's Witnesses, who uh, claim that they're part of, they are one of the 144. And then when you ask them a simple question, well, what tribe are you from? <laughs> right. Like, okay, <laughs> uh, let's move on. <laughs> so, okay. Brother Mitch, one one thing that um, I've tried to share with people, it you know, from this cultural age right here, the time of Moshe and so forth, uh, when this is being instituted and established, um, one of the things from my studies is if you are a foreigner, uh, not dwelling with uh, with Israel, you're not connected to the covenants. Um, every time you saw a Hittite or a Canaanite or whatever, that also told you what deity they worshipped. I mean, their religion and their ethnicity was intertwined um, with their, you know, I mean, it was their upbringing and so forth. And so the one thing that we see, I think, when you talk about a Toshav and a Nakar, is these are foreigners that have connections to other deities in their background, their history, their family upbringing. And so forth. And then when we're talking about Pesach here, we're talking about being forever permanently connected through a covenant relationship with Yahweh. And I think that's where we're getting into why he's not allowing you to eat that Pesach, because you're joining yourself to Yahweh when you partake of that meat. So isn't that interesting? And could that be why Shaul in Corinthians, one of our favorite books today yep. refers to don't eat food offered to idols that's right that's exactly where i was going yep okay so now what 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 just happened what just happened is it very simple that the spirit is now connecting the spirit is bearing witness to the spirit yep. and what happens necessarily as you start to grow spiritually as you be and then instantly you can go and make a connection and then what happens is that you can see how foolish the people are who say that Shaul just made up something brand new and Shaul uh, doesn't know what he's talking about he's not Torah observant blah 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 and what what have we staunchly maintained for quite a number of years, and that is you can't 
understand what he wrote until you understand what he read. And right. it's Torah. Yep. And Tanakh. So again, we have the Ben Nakar, which is the son of a stranger. We have the Toshav, which is um, an alien, somebody who is uh, just passing through temporarily. And, okay, and then all of the congregation of Israel are to celebrate it, but if a stranger, so here's the three words that are important in this section of scripture. And this is what you have to get behind. In 1243, we have Ben Nakar. In 1245, we have Toshav. And now in 1248, we have the Gur. But if a stranger, a Gur, sojourns you, uh, with you and celebrates the Pesach to the Lord, let all his mouths be circumcised and then let him come near to celebrate it. Come near to celebrate it. What did we learn if you have been staying with the Torah in the very first portion of the book of Vayikra and he called Leviticus? Yep. The purposes of the sacrifices, the purposes of the offering, demonstrated in the word korban, is to draw near. And this is what's happening here. Let them draw near to celebrate it. See, it's a celebration. It's not a solemn thing. Although it's solemn, it doesn't mean it can't be celebrated. But it doesn't mean that it has to be a silent, party toddy celebration, and you can't talk. And so, and he shall be like a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person may eat of it. The same shall, the same ordinance law shall apply to the native and to the gur. Again, in 1249, Gur, same word, yeah. sojourns among you. So what's the Gur? The Gur is a non-Israelite who lives among the community. The Gur is subject to the same Torah as the native-born Israelite and is regarded as within the people of Israel. The Gur enjoys all the same rights and privileges of the native-born Israelites as well as the same responsibility. The Torah stipulates if the Gur wants to make a pe Pesach, he and his household are welcome to do so, so long as they consent to circumcision. Rabbinic Judaism refers to this person as a full proselyte to Judaism. The Torah does not. Yep, exactly. Now, That's huge. That's very big. In addition, let's talk, and we talked about the three different terms of, and, and, and here's also, I did this several years ago. I looked at, uh, I went to a Bible Gateway. Was it Bible Gateway? Yeah, Bible Gateway. And I looked at, Every uh, verse, 1243, 1245, 1248, in every single translation. And when you do, be the living vine the tlv or the orthodox jewish bible the ojb why would it be that those three translators have the terms correctly in each and every one of these particular scriptures 1243 1245 and 1248 meaning they have the correct definition of the hebrew but 
in other translations in the English language, you have a hodgepodge and you can see that a word used in the KJV is used differently in the NIV and a word used in the ASV is used differently than the pick a version mm -hmm. and on and on and on and it's mind boggling. And so I asked the question, why would that be? How could it be? Here's the answer. Because you have people that don't or haven't taken the time to look at the Hebrew to understand what it really means and then to give the correct interpretation. But what they do is they have a theological bent and that's what they give. So all of that to say this. Brother Mitch, the wife is asking me something real quick. So uh, okay. go ahead. I'll be right back. So, and Shelley's allowed to intrude. And so all of that to say this, <clears throat> and, and that simply is, why? Why, why, why? And because of theological bent. And it's very, very sad when that happens. And we, we see this in Acts 12, 4, in the uh, King James, where it's the only version that has the Greek word Pascha translated into English as Easter. And every other time the Greek word Pascha is used, it refers to either Pesach itself or Hag Matzah, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Why is that? And there's this big discussion on uh, somebody's page that I threw myself into. And people are, they just don't get it. And God bless them, the KJV only crowd. Oh boy, no, it's gotta be Easter because this is the only authorized version. Well, my friend, do you know why KJV is the only authorized version? It is because the KJV was authorized by the long since dead King Jimmy and he wouldn't authorize it unless his name got, his name was included in the publication. And that's the only reason that it's the only authorized version. It's not authorized that makes it high and mighty and better than anything else. Every translation, every version, if you will, has its own inherent issues. There is no perfect translation of the Bible. The original manuscripts are no longer because if we had them, we would make <coughs> the words of the Bible God as opposed to having the God of the Bible God. So, <clears throat> Now we, we get to, so we see that the Gur is rabbinic Judaism term, refers to a person that has gone through full uh, proselyte, right? they've made full conversion. And there are some, for lack of a better word. And now, because of their theological bent, adhere to rabbinic authority and the Noahide laws. I'm not saying everybody does. I'm saying that there are some who do. Right. Now, here's an interesting point on that. 
in Uganda, which I know well, there are pockets of Jewish people in the uh, in the eastern part of the country. When or if you're inclined, as I am, to have conversation, because you know you're called to Uganda, which I am, you know you're called, uh, your ministry is to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, which is biblical, and you do it through Acts 1-8, which is biblical, but when you're going, you're going to make disciples, which is biblical, so in 2018, the initial plan was I was going to spend time with the Jewish Uganda. And because of issues that I had in Kenya that never materialized. And then sadly, the person that I had developed the relationship with turned out to be a not so kosher, <laughs> okay? And as I started to uh, learn more and more and more about my so-called ethnic Jewish cousins from Uganda, I learned something very unique and something very unusual. That there is not one, well, uh, mm, I'm going to make a blanket statement, so let me take that one back. I have not met a bona fide ethnic Jewish cousin from, and I'm going to clarify it, meaning that they are from one of the original 12 tribes, one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Every single one of the Jewish Ugandans that I have met. Somebody somewhere at one point in time converted. Converted from what? Converted from Christianity to Judaism. Now, let me take this one step forward. Almost all of the time, the Jewish Uganda will tell me I'm not Jewish. Why? Because I believe that Yeshua is Moshiach and that Yeshua is, in fact, Hashem. And that is you, that, that doesn't make you Jew somehow anymore. Yet, they who have converted are Jewish. How is that? <laughs> right. So... Uh, when I go back, and um, we don't, we still don't know when, but it's getting closer. Um, after I become settled uh, with my family, who are in the Rakai district of Uganda, which is down south below the equator, eventually I'll be moving about the country, and um, some of you may know. Uh, a person who is uh, known as Mogaya. And Mogaya leads uh, a uh, messianic synagogue in his district of Kibuku and in his village called Latama. And he is in charge of five other messianic uh, synagogues as well. And there he has a cousin who is converted and uh, I have some interesting conversations with the cousin, but the cousin really doesn't want me to come except if I'm going to bring money. Welcome to Africa. resolution on my behalf soon and that also start praying now 
that I find favor before kings and queens, princes and princesses, as well as leaders of men and women, specifically in Uganda and specifically amongst the Jewish community. I have a lot of contacts now and I'm trying to show them that, you know what? Uh, if you're just being taught Hebrew and you're not being taught the Torah, big deal. Mm 